Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Young. I'm a member of the Committee 100 and I'm also uh, head of the uh, Committee 100 uh, Asian American Career Ceilings uh, 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 Initiative. Um, I am very, very pleased to have uh, the uh, four panelists here today and we're gonna conduct a fireside chat. Before I do that, I just wanna emphasize that this program was set up uh, starting, this will be the 20th event, but it started in February of 2020 uh, with the whole idea that although there's some very powerful and successful efforts around the uh, Asian American career ceilings problem uh, being uh, put forth by Ascend, by LEAP, a number of organizations, they tend to be focused on particular one particular piece of the problem. And we thought there would be a role for the Committee 100 to be sort of a collaborative convening uh, 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 organization to cut across all the different issues, like what does the data show? You know, uh, uh, what are the millennials view? What are the view of women? What are the, what, you know, what's the problem about running for office, so forth, so that you end up with a, you know, a, a collected convening place uh, where all of us can talk about these issues and galvanize. And we did actually even have one what was focused on trying to create solutions. So last year, we got together 120 people and organized them in kind of a, a virtual uh, ballroom. And each table came, was supposed to come up with two or three ideas on how we can do things better. And we came up with 25 idea, actionable ideas that we're, we're working on uh, to try to move those things forward. So, um, so that's the general idea and we'll keep going as long as we're doing something useful. Uh, today's uh, event is part of probably a very important issue which is uh, the technology industry because it's a very visible, very important industry that has a lot of growth uh, and, and, but uh, has its own issues related to the career, uh, career ceiling problem. We're very fortunate to have four really terrific panelists. Uh, Albert Ko, who's the CEO of Early Warning uh, Services, LLC. Uh, Shenwen uh, Kuo, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the High Performance Compute and Artificial Intelligence uh, Group at uh, Hewlett Packard. Deb Liu, who is the president and CEO of uh, Ancestry, but also built a substantial business uh, at, at, at Facebook. And Jeannie Yuen Hong, who we will now call Jenny, right, going forward, who is a vice president of global supply chain quality and reliability and corporate product regulations and standards at Intel. And what I what is good about this mix is we have some diversity of some large companies and smaller companies, some that are early stage, some are so forth. And we did happen to have some diversity by gender. So Al, you're, but you're a little bit uh, outvoted by uh, three uh, three uh, women here. Uh, but uh, it's a, uh, an attempt to try to get some sense around this issue of uh, what does this problem look like in the technology industry? Uh, what are the experiences of these panelists with regard to their own careers that have applicability to those of you who are in attendance? And, and are trying to uh, manage your careers, uh, et cetera. So um, I'd like to start out uh, and ask each of the panelists to briefly take two or three minutes and just describe what you do and, 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 and very basically the career path that you took. Uh, and Al, we'll start with you and then move to Deb and then Shen Wen and then Jenny. Al? Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Terrific. I'm, I'm sitting here in our San Francisco offices. Uh, my name is Al Coe. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, I started my career as a management consultant uh, because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And uh, I, I got recruited by a mentor of mine uh, to a company called Intuit that uh, is better known for QuickBooks, TurboTax, Mint. Deb knows a, Deb knows a lot about this company. I'm sure she'll share uh, here in a moment. And once I got there, uh, as an ex-consultant, I started in corporate strategy, but I quickly realized um, product management was something that I wanted to do. And like a lot of folks, uh, I started in the, the proverbial mailroom. You know, you, you own like a little button and you figure out what it should look like and how it should interact. Uh, and I got really lucky in that, um, you know, caught the, the mobile revolution, you know, right as the iPhone came out before everyone fully realized how 
transformative it would become and uh, launched a, a set of apps that, that were very commercially successful. And I would say that was the big break that I got at, the big com- at a big company and was able to lead product at, for the, the largest division at Intuit in small business. I was able to run Mint and um, uh, join the CEO staff. Um, I, I did that for about five years, a variety of roles. Again, every two years, uh, and so it's the kind of company that moves you into a different role. And I'm now currently the CEO of a company called Early Warning. Most people haven't heard of it. It's very critical to the financial services industry. Most people have heard of Zelle uh, to make payments through your bank. So we actually own and operate that network as well. The company is actually based in Scottsdale, Arizona. So I'm in Arizona a lot, but I'm actually based in the Bay Area. I live in Menlo Park uh, and and I travel a lot for work. I'm, I'm married. My wife works full time too. She's a VC. I've got three kids, one in high school, one in middle school, and one in elementary school, and they're all starting school this week. Fantastic. And we won't ask you which of those things is the most difficult, but it's probably raising the three kids, right? I, I, could, I could definitely get into that, but yes, <laughs> correct answer. All right. Deb, go ahead. Well, I feel like it's uh, difficult to follow Al because my life is so much more similar to Al's than anybody else. Probably I started on management consulting, didn't know what I wanted to do. I uh, went to business school, landed at a startup called PayPal at the time, a few hundred people 20 years ago. And kind of, you know, the I was an eBay seller. I joined the eBay team and suddenly we were bought by eBay the week after I joined. And suddenly I was leading the, the, the integration between the two over the next couple of years. I was working on a bunch of projects to integrate eBay and PayPal, led that team eventually as the head of product management for that, our largest business, and then went on to... Um, do corporate, I actually ended up in corporate strategy for a while as well. And so I feel like I, Al and I, we've had a lot of uh, intersections. Um, eventually, I ended up um, going to eBay and leading the buyer experience and then to Facebook, where I spent 11 years, eventually joining the, the leadership team. Um, during my time at Facebook, I had built a number of products, including the games and payments businesses, so Facebook Pay, which is now rebranded MetaPay, uh, Facebook Marketplace, um, as well as a number of ad products, the ad network. And, and I worked on a number of different things over the years, which was a ton of fun. And during that time, I joined the board of Intuit, how I met Al. Um, which is incredible. And then about a year and a half ago, I got the call about a position as CEO of Ancestry, which is a 35-year-old company that's focusing on helping people find their family history. And so a lot of us, uh, a lot of people know us for our DNA test, but we also have a tremendous subscription business that's really focused on helping people discover their roots and their history and the connections that bind us all. And so that's been an incredible career adventure over the last 20 years here in Silicon Valley. And I live in the Bay Area as well, not too far from where Al lives. And we're both building houses. So we talk about that too. Yeah, so, <laughs> and we've been friends for some time. And Deb, we, I, I see the Ancestry ads on TV every once in a while. And whenever I see that, I think about you. Right? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Shin Wen, you, would you like to go next? Sure, absolutely. So I'm sensing a theme here that management consulting is what we do when we don't know what else we want to do and before we join tech. So I studied chemical engineering and I knew I didn't want to be a process engineer and I knew I didn't want to do academic research. So I too joined strategy consulting, um, which was a wonderful kind of uh, provided a wonderful foundation in business transitioning from engineering. Um, I joined tech uh, in just before the first dot com. Uh, bubble burst for those that remember the first the first iteration. I was very fortunate to join a startup startup that was in high growth mode, um, and I, I did that because I I knew I wanted to build something and technology was very hot. It was moving very quickly and there was a lot of opportunity for growth and iteration. That actually took me abroad to um, to Europe to help build operations there. It was a six to eight month assignment. I ended up staying eight years. We can talk about uh, we can talk about the journey of that at some other point. Um, we took the company public. We were later acquired by uh, by a competitor that was then acquired by SAP. Um, so still have a lot of good friends in that space. Actually, it was in the sourcing and supply chain startup technology space. Um, so Jenny may know them. But uh, I I took a sabbatical to mainland China after helping integrate the, the companies in Europe um, and then made a decision to move back to the U.S. because this is where my family was. And I joined uh, another tech startup much earlier stage. So joining as employee 100 is very different than joining as employee three, which was my second experience, wonderful experience. Um, But then after about a year and a half, 
decided that kind of my growth path was probably different than the company's growth path and, and that it was time to join a large proper company. Um, so I made the decision to join EDS. Unbeknownst to me, it was a few months before the acquisition by HP was announced. So I made the decision to join because I wanted a larger company with more opportunity to grow my career and look for professional opportunities. So a few months later, I definitely got what I wished for because we went from about 160,000 people to about 300,000 people overnight. Um, since then, uh, the company has, we've gone through a lot of um, a lot of changes as EDS, HP, now HPE. So I have been fortunate to have a number of leadership roles, both in global functions and in the business. I also did a stint in corporate strategy. So we've got a, a, a bit of that in common. Um, most recently, I've been leading um, operations and services for our high performance computing and AI business. And um, on the way here, uh, I also took a, took a journey through leading a joint venture in mainland China leading our $8 billion core compute portfolio. And it's been, it's been a really interesting ride. Um, I'm based on the surface of the sun, also known as Dallas, Texas. Oh which, my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> it's, been, it's been very toasty. And uh, <laughs> underneath this background behind me is the white wall of one of our conference rooms in our, in our Houston headquarters where I am for a few days here. So broadcasting from a, a, a balmy environment, if you will. Well, well, clearly the pattern here is uh, join one firm and stay there for, until you get the gold watch. We clearly have established that's the pattern here, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, Jenny, uh, yeah. your career. So I guess I'm a little bit of an anomaly from the rest of all of you have not been in management consulting. Uh, actually, I was born in Hong Kong and my family immigrated to Montreal, Canada when I was six years old. So grew up there, my studies, got married, had our three kids uh, in Montreal. So not American-American in that sense. Uh, I actually started as a software engineer. That was my training. And I worked for Ericsson Communications in mobile telephony design. Did that for a couple of years and then moved into the aerospace industry with Marconi and did a lot of safety critical systems, including microwave landing systems, global positioning systems. Um, my husband decided to leave academia and come work at Intel. So we moved from East Coast to West Coast, Canada to the US in 96. So I've actually been here in Portland, Oregon, working for Intel since 1996. Um, first eight years or so in product qualification, we did switches, routers, uh, Wi-Fi module, network processors, gone through kind of that era of the comms business just before the dot-com and right after the dot-com. Uh, moved into software quality engineering. I started up this new function for Intel in 2005, and it was kind of just going back to my roots of software engineering. Uh, did that for about seven years until my boss asked me to go run customer quality support. So spent about eight years in the field working with our customers, including HPE, uh, and really managing that function with an external interface. And about two years ago, I was asked to go and look at it from the other side of the table, so uh, supply chain quality management. And so I managed that since spring of 2020 with uh, the corporate product regulations and standards, which is our product compliance. So that's been kind of my scope for the past couple of years. And I uh, started it just in the midst of COVID. So for a long time, I did not meet my staff until just most recently. And we are kind of partially back in the office, kind of hybrid right now, so. Okay, great. Well, I think my first question is, is, is pretty straightforward. I mean, over for the previous 19 uh, webcasts, uh, part of the time we've covered specific industries, media and entertainment, uh, you know, nonprofit management, investment banking and, and, and investing, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the one thing that's come out of it is that the nature of this problem really can be quite different by industry. So I, I guess the next question is, are there any specific impediments that you faced being Asian American uh, in the technology industry, right? And, and because the barriers can be different depending upon what industry you're in. And, you know, and, and not only, what were some impediments you specifically uh, faced, but also stepping back and looking at the careers of a lot of people around you who are Asian American, you know, are, do you have any impediments you think Asian Americans face 
you know, as Asian Americans in the technology industry. And uh, I'll open it up to any panelists and anyone who wants to speak or not speak, it's up to them. So maybe I'll go ahead and get started. Go ahead, Jenny. Point. Um, so I think when we say barrier, I think there's two levels of barriers. I think from a representation for East Asians, uh, there's a lot of us in the tech industry because most of us had the encouragement to go into the sciences, to engineering. It's a very popular kind of profession, more so than maybe artistry, drama, English, right? Uh, and so I think if I actually look at our Intel and even the companies I've worked with in Ericsson and Marconi, there, there are a lot of Asians in the population. The difference is how far up the executive level do they get, right? And I think um, partly culturally, we're not taught to really promote ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of humility and being humble and we work hard and we get things done. But sometimes because you're really good at what you're doing, people, management would love to keep putting you in that same row to keep doing it because you get it done. And there is a little bit less um, motivation for some leaders to move you up or move you to other roles and vocation, different jobs. And if you're not asking for it, those opportunities don't come up. And, and so I think sometimes it's a bit of what we don't ask for, right? It's so we need to be the squeaky wheel every once in a while to really get noticed, right? Yes. Anyone, anyone else want to comment? Yeah, to build on what Jenny said, which I think is such an excellent point. Um, what, there's a saying that uh, they did, another Asian American colleague here mentioned uh, um, in a discussion we were having, which is very different from culturally how we're raised, right? And the saying is closed mouths don't get fed. So the, the sometimes the, the impediment we face is this holding on to the meritocracy myth and everything that we were, we grew up and were learning and, and the structure that we're put in is, all right, you work really hard, you get good grades, that gets noticed, and then you move up to the next level. And that's not actually how the world outside of school and academia works, right? It's actually um, learning the language of learning the language of leadership and acknowledging that um, that for many of our for many of our peers and our colleagues and ourselves, leadership in in the U.S. and in Western cultures doesn't always look like we look, and so there's there's a need to just acknowledge the elephant in the room, um, and to um, also recognize that it can be a lot of. In talking to some of my my colleagues, one of the things that one of the themes that emerges is there's a lot that we take on. Um, in terms of other people's expectations or assumptions. And my coaching is always, that can't be, um, you can't hold that very, it's so close to your heart, right? You gotta kind of, you can't put all that burden on yourself to overcome everybody else's assumptions. Sometimes you just have to step over it and move on. And, you know, you, you can do great work, you can, but you have to, um, and, and and while acknowledging that there are challenges based upon other people's perceptions, you have to, as Jenny said, you have to ask for the roles. If I think back on the times, the inflection points in my life where I was, where I was advancing, um, it was because I asked for it. And I didn't always, and it didn't happen the first time I asked for it in many instances, right? It happened um, increasingly, you know, as you advance in your career, increasingly it takes more campaigning and more advocacy and more strategy as to how you're going to advance and expand your role and expand your scope and expand your impact. Yeah, that's right. Deb, any comments on you and your side? You've been through a number of, you know, organizations that, you know, in the technology industry. Well, I think what Jenny said about self-promotion is what I hear a lot when I speak to Asian American groups. They say, well, I'm really bad at self-promotion. And I say, if you call it self-promotion, you're not going to do it. Instead, if you call it educating people on the work that you and your team are doing, if you talk about amplifying impact, suddenly you've changed the way that you look at it. And I think we're kind of taught, you know, my dad told me, keep your head down, get the work done, you know, and I, that is not what the workplace in America is really about, but, you know, he grew up in a very different time with different expectations. And I think that is what's something we're taught. So it is something to keep in mind is to reframe 
you know, what does leadership look like and how can we model that leadership? I remember saying that to somebody, by the way, and and I wrote, you know, I wrote this article um, that's in courts about finding my voice as an Asian American woman. And somebody said, well, doesn't that smack of assimilation? And I just remember that moment thinking, you know, I said, no, I actually took some time I, and I said, no, it's actually adaptation. We're adapting to the culture that we're in and adapting doesn't mean we're giving up ourselves. It means that we're adapting so that we can lead in the style that makes other people more you know, successful in this society. And that's not a bad thing. If we work in Asia, there's different cultural norms and we would conform to that as well. And I think using the word assimilation is actually something that's very, that keeps us from actually doing what's necessary to be successful and to help our colleagues be successful in an environment that is not the environment that our parents grew up in or taught us. Yeah, and it's very generational. By the way, uh, one of our webcasts we had on, you know, how families raise their kids, and it was fascinating. We had four parents, different ethnicities, one Indian American, Chinese American, et cetera, talk about how, a different generation, talk about how they raise their kids and this very issue, because a lot of this starts in how you're raised, right? And there was an acknowledgement that uh, in some cases, uh, the parents screwed up by sort of saying, as you know, Jenny and Shen Wei says, that, you know, put your head down, study and hard and they'll recognize you. And so I, I think that's a big issue. And a lot of this is, uh, one, you, those of you in the audience, uh, you have to think about it saying, do I need to rebel from what my parents were telling me what to do? But you should also say, look, if I have kids, I got to think about this, right? I got to think about how I raise them to help them succeed, right, uh, in in the current environment. Al, your comments? Yeah, first of all, I, I love the earlier comments and, and the insights. Thank you for those. I'll start with a couple of things that I think um, are truths and biases that are out there, good and bad. So, so one, in my own life experience, overwhelmingly, people of all stripes are nice people, want to do the right thing and want to work with the best possible colleagues around them, whoever they are. And I, and I think it's important to start with that. I feel that way. I hope everyone here feels that way, that most people are not monsters with an agenda. Most people just want to do the best possible work, and it requires a team to do that. I think that's very important. It's also important to recognize there are some favorable stereotypes. I don't know that I try to amplify them, but that work in our favor. So uh, on this panel, I only know Deb from before, but I understand all three uh, women are have a technical background, certainly uh, undergraduate study. Uh, I majored in uh, history and specifically colonial Latin American history, probably the worst thing to study to try to get a job. Uh, but funny enough, when I was graduating from college uh, and I kind of went down that traditional path, I was interviewing at consulting firms and investment banks. At one particular investment bank, kind of a renowned bank, uh, some guy just was making conversation during an interview. I was a senior in college and he said, oh, you're a history major. How do I know that you're good at math? And I said, I'm Korean, so don't worry about it. And I was just making light of it. <laughs> I was just making light of it, right? He was making small talk. I was making small talk. And then it turned serious. He said, oh yeah, that's true. He didn't even give me the math test that everyone else got. <laughs> and I got an offer. And I tell that story as kind of a silly story, but there are biases. Or in my career, people just assume I'm a software engineer, even though I, I, I'm a humanities guy. I went to law school, so I am not technical, um, e even though I've had to learn a lot of elements of it. Uh, and I, I would say that generally uh, works in my favor, right? On the other hand, and we know this, and I'm sure this panel has talked about it, and, and this organization has talked about it, there's automatic kind of minus points for leadership, right? And, and uh, I, I'm sure everyone's following in the press, the, the case that's before the Supreme Court, I think it'll be adjudicated in the next session of the court, the, you know, the Harvard admissions uh, affirmative action case. Uh, and whatever you feel about affirmative action, and I'll just go on the record of saying, I support affirmative action. It does bother me that automatically every Asian applicant gets a demerit on your application for leadership as a way of equaling the playing field yeah, that right. bothers me because it perpetuates existing stereotypes. So to, to me, the, the only thing, your work has to speak for itself. And the only advice I would have, if, if everyone could, could take one course or practice 
is a lot more is a lot more public speaking, and it can be on stage in front of hundreds or thousands, or it could just be in a room of twenty people. I think the more articulate you are, the more confidently you can express your ideas, you are get, you're going to be able to overcome those biases. Yeah. Uh, and and so that would be my only tangible bit of advice. I think a lot of other things sometimes smacks of self promotion that I I think can cut both ways. I'm sure this is a much larger conversation, but the public speaking element, if you're good at it, people assume you're a great leader and, and it will open a lot of doors. Yeah. In fact, uh, very recently, Warren Buffett was asked, if you were to pick one skill that's key to success, he surprised everyone. He says, it's writing and speaking. If you know, there's no matter what job you're going to be in, uh, you have to be able to uh, speak well or write well, uh, uh, you know, communicate. Mm -hmm which is really interesting. And he didn't say, oh, you have to have superior knowledge of company values and so forth. By the way, Al, uh, fess up now. Are you really good in math? <laughs> <laughs> no comment, but... Uh... No co oh, all right. Okay, all right. Okay, no, okay. Right. Good, good enough, good enough. All right, I'm sorry. I thought you might confess in front of all these people, right? Uh, whether you really were uh, good or not. Now, you know, one of the possible criticisms... Not compared to these ladies. I'll, I'll just say that. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, uh, you know, one of the possible criticisms of panels like these, if you pick successful people, is, oh, gee, you picked a bunch of successful people. So, you know, they didn't have a problem. It's also true, though, that every successful person I know, famous or not famous, ran into, you know, various challenges along the way. And the key is not so much that, hey, here are four successful people. So, you know, their lessons are key to be, it's how you got there, right? So any comments about what you, each of you or any individual had to fight through somewhere in your career where you, you know, you hit a barrier and so forth, and then how did you get through it? And did it relate to your being Asian American? So, uh I'll touch on something Al mentioned that um, that I actually I had almost an inverse experience on the good at the good at math. I was um, when I was working for a startup, I had a um, discussion with the uh, with a senior executive there about um, kind of opportunities, growth opportunities, and what the what the next um, what the next um, phase could look like. And he said something just kind of casually offhand. He said, um, well, you know, you have something working for your, to your advantage um, because you studied engineering. Um, so even though you're a woman, no one will ever, you know, people will, won't question whether or not you are um, strong analytically and analytical problem solving. And until that statement in that moment, it never occurred to me that somebody might question my analytical problem solving bona fides. And, and I studied in a, in a course with where most of the top students in, uh, in my chemical engineering course just happened to be women. And then the one guy that pulled his weight, so we let him study with us um, and, and be our lab partner. But, um, and he went on to get a PhD. But it never occurred to me that that might be a question in someone's mind. So I didn't, I wasn't looking to answer it or address it. Um, and the, um, I had another experience, same startup where one of the executives that had hired me said, um, one of the founders, um, casually at a dinner said to me, um, you know, you would make a great executive wife and yes, mm -hmm. he didn't mean an executive who was married to someone. He meant, um, Oh, the wife of an executive. So, and he had one picked out for me. He was very avuncular. So he, he thought he was looking out for me. Um, and to Al's point, you know, good guy, like wanted to, um, wanted to do good work, grow his business. He'd hired me, but he had world, he had limitations um, in his worldview as to what the possibilities for me were. And so one of the things that um, I think is really, really valuable is getting feedback, not just on your performance, but on other people's perceptions. And you've got to be able to create that space to, um, to hear what those feedback, what that feedback is, because, and also recognize that's not about you. Um, it's about their perspectives on what's possible for you. And sometimes people's perspectives on what's possible for you 
um, it, it's good to know that if it's going to limit your pathway in interacting with them, right? And I would point out at the time, I was an executive at the startup. I was leading roughly 50% of the European revenue. Um, and uh, and it, it was an interesting moment. So we, you know, kind of had a, had a discussion and he painted the pathway for me um, <laughs> in his own, in his own terms. And we're still, we're still in touch. He could still call on me and I think I could still call on him. But, um, you know, to Al's point that, you know, most people aren't monsters. It's just, everybody's got a worldview. So the sooner you can learn that and then just deal with what's in front of you, I think the better. Did you change his perspective along the way? Well, I'm not an executive wife running somebody's foundation, so. Oh, okay. No, I meant that, you know, that specific person, you know, who had sort of um, stereotyped you. You know, I didn't, and I didn't spend a lot of time on it. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense, right? Yeah. Because my purpose wasn't to, now don't get me wrong, I, I would love to have, um, I would love to have had his, enlightenment be part of the journey, but it wasn't necessary for my journey. And it wasn't really my purpose. It was like, we can have a great relationship. You can have your worldview. I can have mine. Our pathways will diverge and you move on. Um, so I think sometimes there are these unspoken assumptions. Uh, there are unspoken assumptions about that we've already kind of talked about, about what, um, how, how the Asian American stereotypes fit or don't fit into what we believe leadership work looks like. Deb's made some incredibly you know, great points about adaptation and dealing with, look, I'm an idealist and I would love the world to be as I, I would like it to be fair and just and full of truth and beauty and light. However, I'm also, there's a part of me that's a pragmatist that says, listen, you only get a shot to make the world that you want when you deal with the world that we have, right? right? So, so we got to deal with what's in front of us with the best tools and, and adapting to the environment if we're going to have a chance to carve out the world that we want. Yeah. Al, any comments on, on this issue? Uh, setbacks that you had that somehow related to Asian American and how you broke through it. If the answer is no, that's okay. You, you know, I, I've had more setbacks than I can count uh, career-wise. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people assume, I'll just say one thing, and, and I'm sure everyone on this panel would also say, they, they might assume, oh, you're so, so successful. Somehow you went from one promotion to the next. Uh, and that's definitely not the case. I'm conf I can confidently say for everyone, I, I don't know that I'd attribute any one reason uh, or any particular setback to being Asian. Like, like I said, I'm more of an optimist about the world. I will say I've heard, you know, comments, uh, Shin Wen referenced one, but uh, just of comments that definitely are tinged with, uh, I would say, uh, more than unconscious bias, conscious bias uh, uh, along the way, like uh, that, you know, for example, a lot of people say that I'm funnier than they thought. Well, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> I like to think I'm a funny guy, but then they thought, right, this is someone that I meet for the first time, um, uh, kind of thing. So, it's out there, those biases are out there, but I think, you know, um, at, at the end of the day, pick yourself up, keep focusing, uh, and, and, and good things will happen. And I, I do think people like optimists, people like people who are going to be resilient. Um, and so I think that's just a leadership principle that I tell anyone, uh, but, but I, I think the setbacks are real, but I wouldn't, and the biases are real, but but if you wallow in the self-pity of so-and-so is excluding me, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you, you have to control your own destiny. That, that would be my perspective. Yeah. You know, I remember when, you know, uh, un, uh, unlike Jenny, but like Shen Wen and Al and Deb, I started out in strategy consulting at Bain & Company when there were 23 people. And I went through early on the first year, I went through wow. an experience related to being Asian American, which could have killed my career because you know, and, and Bill Bain brought me in the office and he says, you know, I have good news and bad news. And I said, OK, uh, he said, the good news is you've been incredibly good at solving client problems and complex problems and so forth. But the very thing that has caused you to be successful in school at the schools you've gone to in the Harvard Business School is to uh, show people how smart you are and you're pissing people off because <laughs> you don't know it. You don't, you're not trying to make them feel bad, but they feel bad while, because you're trying to show that you have the answer. 
So you've got to figure out how to deliver the answer in a way that doesn't cause them to feel bad. So you better change. But, you know, if you keep this going on, you know, you're not going to be here. And that was the first thing. But he actually said, I understand it's your upbringing, right? I mean, that's the way, you know, Asian American kids are supposed to be, right? Be really smart, demonstrate. So, you know, it, it, but but that was a major change in my perspective on, on the world. Deb, anything on, on, on setbacks and, and what you learned from it? Well, I think that the interesting part is, as Al said, you know, it's it's not like it's really obvious when somebody doesn't give you an opportunity because you're Asian American. Like, it's not overt. They don't go, hey, I'm not going to promote you because of X. But if you look at the numbers, the numbers are actually pretty obvious that, you know, there are reasons why people who are Asian American are promoted at a much lower rate, don't reach the C-suite, that, you know, they're like 30, 40 percent of tech companies, but maybe less than 10 percent of the executives, right? Either they're terrible at what they do or they don't aspire to grow their careers, or there's something in the system that is, mm -hmm. is a barrier. And one of those things is true, and you can believe what you want, but I'll just put it out there. And, you know, for me, I have been passed over for jobs, and, and I think it's, you know, and I, I spent years actually during the years between when my son was born and when my youngest daughter was born, and several years after she was born, I didn't get promoted once. In fact, I took a demotion to go to Facebook. For six years, I basically, my career was stuck, and I just couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. And the thing is, nobody told me what it was and I had to figure it out. But I think those are the moments when you have to decide. Like, do, And I thought about leaving tech multiple times during that time. In fact, I resigned um, during that time to actually quit. Um, and I almost did it a second time um, after the birth of, so I did that after the birth of my first child and then I considered doing it after the birth of my third child. And I don't know that it's related to being Asian American, but the numbers don't lie either. And so you kind of have to figure it out. So for me, I don't think anyone has ever said that to me. And I don't think that's an issue as much as I didn't lead the way other people expected me to lead. And, and that's something I had to figure out for myself. I had to figure out how to navigate an organization where people were very different and I felt very different. And I was, it took me a long time to figure that out. And it was something that was on me to figure out. I wish it weren't that that weren't the case. I wish it wasn't that that's not the expectation, but it is. And so for me, I have to adapt, as I say, to the culture and figure out how to find my voice within a culture that was very different than the way I was raised and the expectations I had for what a workplace looks like. Well, the way I'm going to, I'm going to, before I move to the next question, I'm going to mention one thing that doesn't apply to the four panelists, but is something worth uh, thinking about if you're an attendee. Um, one of the classic things is if you're Asian to be promoted to be head of Asia or head of China or whatever, and you want to really think very carefully about that, because if you trace what's happened to people who then who are Asian, who get uh, appointed to be head of China or so forth, uh, very often they never make it out of that stereotype. So think about it very carefully. I mean, I only know of one CEO of a U.S. public company who whose career included being head of Asia, who then ended up being the CEO of the company. But you get trapped because you get you get stereotyped as the Asia person, right? And that's just something that, that doesn't apply to the three, the four panelists here, but it's something I've heard from lots of people. So it's just something to think about. It might seem like an opportunity, but it it, it could also be you know a, a trap. Now, uh, one other thing for each of you is: Are there any notable catalysts, whether it's education, mentors, or opportunities, or or career decisions that were transform, you know, trans were, were a transformation with regard to your success. Uh, you know, because a lot of what people talk about is mentors, figuring out opportunities, when to move and change, and and so forth. So to any of the panelists, you know, are there any factors, catalysts that you would cite that were transformational in your career? Maybe I'll go start on this one is um, I and, and it's something I never seeked out. I never seeked out a mentor or a sponsor or anything. And over time, whenever somebody assigned somebody to me, it never worked out. You know, I, I kind of felt like I was doing the mentoring of the person that was assigned to me because I I'll be in software and they assign me somebody who's a fellow in process technology, you know, like just the worlds didn't match. But their thought was, oh, she's a woman, you're a woman, therefore it works. You know, it doesn't work that way. But um, 
unbeknownst to me when I was running soft equality, which was kind of my dream because that was where my education is. And I had done the startup from four people to 80 people over seven years. So it was kind of ran the whole function as a startup. I didn't want to let go. And my boss at the time at my VP really literally dragged me kicking and screaming from that job, taking it away from me and telling me to go work in customer quality which was a function I never aspired for. It was not a function that, um, it wasn't run by a VP at the time. And it wasn't something that I consider or thought of doing. Uh, about a year and a half, less than two years into that job is when I got promoted to VP. And it was really the opportunity to showcase my leadership from one environment. And what I learned afterwards, it was the idea that you prove yourself that you're not just a one trick pony, like you're not just only good at one thing. You could take that leadership skill and apply it in a completely different area. The other is when you're working with customer, you're with other executives, it's that executive presence, which they always tell you you need to have, right? It's that proof point that you have that. And uh, in fact, that's what got me my BP. And it never dawned on me. It never, it wasn't an aspiration. I didn't even think it was within my grasp or within my reach to be a VP at Intel. I, there were not a lot of role models to go by a lot of Asian women VPs at the time. And so it was really um, something that I didn't aspire for, didn't ask for. However, I had a boss who advocated for me, who determined that I had that capability and actually put me into a scenario where it was something I could prove myself and then therefore warrant that promotion. So sometimes uh, unbeknownst to you, uh, there's somebody looking out for you. And that was the fortune I had was that there was somebody who looked out for me and, and helped me along the way. But I don't think I would have gone there without him. So. Mm -hmm. And I, I would reflect on, I answered the question in the chat, but you know, Jenny is talking not about a mentor or a manager, but a sponsor, somebody who opens doors and pushes you through when yeah. you don't think that's the right thing. And that's been completely transformational in my career. The biggest step functions I've had in my career is when I had a person who said, I think you can do this. You can be the head of the product for the eBay business at PayPal, which is our biggest business. When you like, I was two years out of business school, you know, so, and I had barely, maybe two or three years out of business school. I had been a product manager for that long. That's it. And that was a huge step function for my career. And the next one was when I was thinking about leaving tech and somebody, you know, the a VP I went to resign to said, I'll get you another job. And then I headed up the buyer experience at eBay and it go on, you know, I've joined the board of Intuit because Cheryl Sandberg called and said, you know, she introduced me to Brad Smith, who's the CEO of, of Intuit. And, you know, each opportunity is one where it's somebody like Jenny is saying, who opens doors for you. And the thing is in sponsorship, by the way, most people look for people who look like them. And it's like, this is me 10 years ago. That's the kind of people who get sponsored. And so we, if there's not a lot of people like you in the executive suite, it's much harder. But that said, each one of these people, you know, look nothing like me, have very, very different backgrounds, but each of them opened incredible doors for me. And I think that that's something that our community could use more of is these sponsors who are going to help us, you know, advance. And I would not be here today without kind of a handful of people. And I've written a lot about this on my um, newsletter and other places in my book. You know, these are the people who really transform your career. And I just think that we underestimate how important that is. And Jenny highlights exactly what that means. Yeah, and you know, there's sort I, of a, I love there's kind of a catch-22 for Asian Americans, which is a, if you don't have that many senior Asian Americans, then you there are fewer Asian American mentors. So you really got to change your definition of mentor and say, look, okay, I, I have a disadvantage because there are not a lot of senior people who can mentor me. So you got to say, I've got to redefine it and say, I should, I should try to create mentors regardless of what their ethnicity is, because otherwise I'm not going to succeed. How about the other two, Al and, and Shen Wen, well, the, the role of mentors? I was just going to say, I, I, love, I love Jenny's comment about um, the, the fact that relationships need to be more organic. It's something that she needs to seek out as opposed to some artificial mentorship program. And then Deb, uh, I, I always learn from you, but this def, this distinction between sponsorship and mentorship, I, I think is a very, very big deal. You know, my dad uh, always taught me, and it's, it seems like a universal principle, but that, you know, 
deep relationships and human bonds are what matters most. And my best friends are my friends from when I was eight years old. Uh, and I, my colleagues, my, my, the best colleagues I work with, I wanted to feel like uh, we're family, not just a, a transactional, I depend on you at work, you depend on me, so let's work together in an ideal scenario. That doesn't always happen. And the greatest sponsors in my life using Deb's uh, uh, lexicon, which, which I love, you know, I'll give you just one example. And, and actually, I think Shinwen, Deb, and I all worked at BCG at one point, uh, which is a odd coincidence. Um, not as good as Bain Peter, but almost as good. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I was working at BCG and uh, this partner who happens to be German, uh, born and raised in Germany, but, you know, lives here. Uh, he has been a sponsor throughout my career. And funny enough, I never even worked on a project with him. But why? Uh, we just got along interpersonally and he had older kids whose weddings I've been at now subsequently, but who were in high school at the time. And I took the time to just mentor them through the college application process. Why? Because I am interested in it. And he was so appreciative uh, that just some you know, young, young kid would do that that uh, when he went to Intuit, he brought me along, exaggerated my capabilities in front of senior leaders, which opened doors. And, uh, and that was a gift that has, has you know, kept on giving uh, for decades. Um, and, and I have three or four other such sponsors in my life who it was not, I didn't have an agenda. I just care about them and their families. And it's because of that, that they care about me. We know each other as humans. I don't think they see me as uh, some up and coming Asian American. They see me as an extension of their family. And then, you know, and then professional things happen as well. So I, I don't know if that's instructive at all, but I think this notion of sponsorship, even bleeding into the relationships, the, the ties that, that bind, that are durable, that aren't just, you're my boss, so therefore you do my annual re review, therefore you might help me get promoted, but rather I care about you, you care about me, we're in this together, so let's make it happen. Uh, Peter, I, I, I'd love to learn more about your story one day. I'm sure you have a, a gazillion of those as a pioneer that helped pave the way for us, uh, and hopefully we're gonna pave the way for the next generation, but that's my two cents in terms of, you know, building on, on Jenny and Deb's great fun. No, that, it's a very good point. And it, it does point out that, you know, something that Dale Carnegie, you know, you know, praise people go around, you know, brown nosing or whatever. It may work in some things, but it's just not that genuine, right? That's really what you're saying, right? That's right. Yeah. Shin Wen, any comments on the, ment the mentorship or any of the issues related to catalysts in your career? I love the distinctions around mentorship and sponsorship and really that advocacy of who's carrying your paper and saying your names in the rooms you're not in, right? So important. And there have been several people who have said my name in rooms that I'm not in. And by the way, um, I'll note one other distinction. So um, unlike Peter, Al, Deb, and Jenny, I go by my um, misphoneticized. I learned this in my third year. My name is misphoneticized from Mandarin into English. Um, and I learned this when I went to mainland China and people looked at the characters and they looked at the phoneticization. But um, so my parents go by Jen and James. My brother and I go by Shinwen and Shinpei. And if you ask my father why, he will tell you, I didn't think we were staying long. So, <laughs> and, but over time, name becomes identity, right? So um, even my name, which I, I think is phonetically pretty easy to sound out, um, people often, I've learned over time, people often, um, will stumble on it because it's not familiar. And um, I've actually had senior executives I've known for a decade who uh, mispronounced my name in a Zoom call, by the way, where the name was spelled out underneath my face. And, and it's not because they're trying to be disrespectful or anything like that, but they're just trying to, they're moving fast. The topic was, and they were you know, accessing something that was familiar to them. Um, and so the saying, the more that we say the names of people that are unfamiliar, the unfamiliar names, the more that we give, make that visible, make our community, you know, make our community visible, vocalize that. I think the more over time, 
um, we build that foundation of familiarity. Um, the other thing I would say that's been catalytic for me um, beyond sponsorship is really reframing. So there have been people in my life who have reframed the way that I think about um, what I'm capable of and the way that I think about um, how I can make an impact. And uh, I actually met for, for coffee very briefly with one of them, colleague um, uh, here at HPE earlier today. Um, and one of the, he was previously our uh, chief diversity officer and um, has, his name's Brian Tippins for those of you who know him, but he, um, he, he reframed early on for me that, you know, every, it, we, we often wait until we think we need to wait till we get to a certain level to have impact or a certain level to have to have to have power or make a difference or or you know for our stories to be to be valuable to someone and um what i would encourage everyone to think about is there were you know there's not a magic inflection point where suddenly you have power suddenly you have you make impact suddenly your voice matters um so for us as a community, I think it's important for us to reframe and think about where, where and how we can add value and support the community. Um, and then another colleague of mine recently, as we were thinking about our, our board seat search, board seat searches, um, and Deb, I'm sure you, Deb and, um, and team, I'm sure you all have lessons to share for about this. But one of the things that she was um, helping me think through is kind of reframing how we turn up the, the thermostat setting, right? What's that? You know, if you look left and look right and think about the peer set, you have something to add. And so turn up the thermostat setting for yourself. So those have been really valuable conversations, just point in time things that you, you ruminate over um, and, and work to incorporate. Yeah. Now on the next question uh, is as follows. I mean, uh, we tried to create some diversity in this panel, but obviously it's impossible. You know, we can't have a panel of 50 people, right? It's impossible to be diverse along every line, right? However, I do want to pose this question to you, to the four of you because even though just the, the four of you are have specific careers in specific companies, you've been exposed to enough technology companies and people in technologies, so you probably be able to generalize around this. So <clears throat> the technology industry, like pretty much every industry, has many different segments. It's you know it's not just hardware or software. Uh, you know, the, you know, et cetera, but also very different corporate structures. You know, they're large corporations, they're partnerships, they're startups, there are, you know, growth uh, companies in midsize. So can you share some of your views of your perspective and not just from your own company, because I'm trying to get, help the audience get a sense for the bigger picture. Can you share with the differences that you see particularly along, you know, for example, startups and growth companies and, and, and large companies, but also some of these different segments, whether the problem of Asian American career ceilings is different, either more serious or, or different in character, and point the way into what, you know, in a way, answer it in a way that helps you, uh, you know, audience say, okay, what am I going to get myself into if I say join a startup versus, you know, an Intel or HP, right? A little complicated question, but an important question. So um, I'll take a cut at it. My time at a startup, at both startups, um, and I think it it matters when you join, but you are wearing all hats, right? You're leaning in and solutioning and wearing all hats. So you're kind of doing everything. It's a wonderful opportunity to see things end to end and to have the full context of how the business problem gets solved for the end customer. Um, corporations, in my experience, tend to be organized much more in functional silos and, um, and to focus on domain expertise in the way they're more structured organizationally. And sometimes that can, and I think there is still benefit because every business problem manif manifests itself horizontally across those organizational silos. So over time, as, you, as I think about kind of startup versus um, uh, corporate, and I've enjoyed both the experiences for different for different reasons, um, you know, the navigating your career, navigating advancement in each environment can be, um, uh, you know, it, it presents different challenges. A startup is aspiring to be a large company where they have the challenges of needing to scale and therefore more specialization. Once you get into the corporate world, we need people who can look across all the functional silos, integrate the, the, the issues, 
um, and then create a solution that delivers to the end customer horizontally. So that that's my take on it. But do you think do you think there's more or less barriers to Asian Americans if they're in a startup versus a, a mature company? You know, I could imagine what? a lot depends on the company and the, yeah. culture. the companies right. are so different. Yeah. I actually, you know, I had such career opportunities when PayPal was a small company and it was just it was step functions. My career grew a ton in a short period of time. But then, you know, it stalled out for a while. And then I joined Facebook when it was like 900 people. And it was, again, lots of opportunity. And so I think that a lot of it is like the environment you're in versus being at a big company like it, it's really about, do you have the sponsorship? Is this the culture that you want? Do they have the values that you care about? And yeah. you're going to thrive in a place where you align your values, align on the mission and feel like you can have impact. And I think you can have that a very small company or you can, and a lot of the small companies might become big companies, in which case you'll have opportunities. I don't think it's systemic in either one. I think it's a lot is very localized. Mm -hmm. I think it is related to whether the company is growing or constrict. Mm -hmm right? If a company is growing, almost the opportunity continues and, you know, your scope just grows automatically because the company is growing or there's mm -hmm. more opportunities available to you. When a company is stagnant or maybe even uh, downsizing, it becomes a little bit more of a survival instinct. And, you know, where Al keeps referring to people are good, um, it can get a little more competitive. It can be a little bit more, um, challenging to work in that environment and when people get into a survival mode they're not always in their best behavior so I think I, I and I've seen you know we I've been through different companies at different stages and even Intel ourselves have gone massive expansion when I joined Intel we were maybe 30,000 employee we're about 120,000 employee now we've gone up and down you know so I think uh, the the growth of the company the environment offers um, opportunities or causes a more competitive environment. So yeah. I don't know. That's, that's a very good point. And obviously there, you know, it's very clear there are a lot more politics in a large company than a small company. I mean, a small company can be very political, but just, you know, gen generically larger companies by definition, there's just a lot more politics. And if you don't have growth, it gets even more intense, right? So uh, 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 yeah, the, only, the only ad I'd make, Peter, is um, I, I do think there are big like regional differences. I, I don't have the data on promotion, but in terms of the environment. So, you know, I know Deb is at a uh, principally Utah based company. M my company is principally based in, you know, Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, where there's very few Asian Americans. Um, or when I was a summer intern once at a Boston law firm. Uh, it, it was the first time in my life where I felt very much a minority uh, in a way that was extremely pronounced in the way I was treated, not negatively, but just as someone very different. Yeah. And so I, I do think uh, to the degree that feeling comfortable in your environment, large or small matters, the industry you pick, the city that you're in will have an impact. I'm not here to suggest one is better than the other. I don't have the data. Uh, and I agree with the general points. I don't know if the, there are a huge difference between small and large, other than you got to find the right cultural fit. But I will say it's been very eye-opening, you know, after spending most of my career in the, in the Bay Area to be in Arizona most of the time. And I'm actually deeply involved in the business community and the CEO community in Arizona. It's very different. Um, the politics are different. Uh, the, what people like to do, the, the, the cuisine, and all of that, and, and and you know, it matters some. And so, you know, if, if that matters to you, it's probably something to think about before you make a, a big career choice. Yeah, and in fact, even more broadly, but it, what it does say is, do your homework on the specific company you're thinking of joining. And That's right. geogra geography is one, personality, uh, what's the style and the philosophy of the CEO and the rest of the, so, we could talk about technology, you know, small companies, but the fundamental is do your homework about the company that you're thinking about joining. And then just be really honest about yourself and say, you know, where do I fit? Right. Because we're all different and separate from the fact that we're talking about being Asian American. Boy, there's a variety of different uh, personalities and styles. So do your homework about the company, regardless of what sector it's serving or where where it's located because 
those can drive differences in your success, right? Uh, so uh, I just want to remind the audience that uh, we are going to leave about uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions at the end. I notice people have, uh, you know, have, have been putting in questions under the uh, Q&A. So please do that because we're going to start by selecting questions that you have, uh, you have typed in. So um, one of the questions is this, which is, uh, one of the things that's very important is not to make a decision about an industry based on what it looks like exactly today. You know, an example is if you want to be a doctor, you shouldn't think about what it's like to be a doctor today. You should think about where it's, how it's changing because, you know, the people who became doctor, you know, decided to be doctors, you know, 20 years ago, the whole medical profession has changed dramatically. It's trying to be, you know, and the individual doctor practicing has become almost impossible. Now, 10 years from now, it's going to be even more different. So I guess the question is this, the technology industry, without question, every five years is changing pretty dramatically. If you were to put your crystal ball in front of you and say, how is the technology industry going to change over the next five to 10 years? Because a lot of the people in the audience here are actually mid-career or early career. So for them, it's not what does Intel or HP or Ancestry or you know early warning look like today. It's what are the the industry going to look like in five or ten years when th that's when I'm going to be trying to succeed. Any comments on what the changes you, you see and how they relate to this question about career advancement for Asian Americans? I didn't promise any easy questions, so this one's a tough one. <laughs> So I think there are three trends that help kind of um, open doors and level the playing field a bit more. The first is around um, the move to more remote or hybrid work. So HPE is very, very um, remote enabled. We're very focused on finding the best talent where that talent exists. Um, you know, sometimes there, there's time zone proximity issues and practice pragmatic things like that for serving customers. But that move towards more remote work, I, I think enables us to, to, in the same way that it enables, you know, kind of the broader talent pools to be more flexible about the responsibilities they may have to their, to childcare or elder care um, and their communities. It also kind of opens up geographically where that talent can be placed. Now, I do personally think there is advantage, particularly early in your career. And there, and I, had advantages, I think, from being able to be in the room and actually build relationships. I think Deb made a great point about um, learning to read the room and that all communication will be filtered through the relationship you have with the individual. Um, she made it in the it, written in the Q and A, and and so uh, you know, I'm I'm an advocate of the kind of the the hybrid model of in office some days, but also that remote work I think opens up the flexibility. The second piece I think is this. Um, the the reframing of um, communities and the the diversity of communities and how how they can get built. So, for example, none of us. Um, oh, actually, Al and Deb, I guess, knew each other before. But you know, Peter brought us together. Um, I was introduced to Peter through Bhakti, who I, I know is listening and is supporting. Um, and he and I happened to, to connect because we've, we've not had the opportunity to meet in person. So none of us have actually met in person, but you know, kind of the, the technology enables that um, kind of uh, diversification, the spread of the community. Um, so that in and of itself, I think opens up new, um, new opportunities for people to make their voices heard in different ways um, and democratizes kind of, again, that giving voice to your story before, you know, you reach some mythological inflection point of power, so. But it, it, it's certainly going to change the way you develop relationships and mentors and so forth, because you can't do it exactly the same way remotely than, uh, you know, than, than, than uh, you know, in person. And uh, well, it certainly means it'd be hard to discriminate based on height, right? Because everyone's the same height in Zoom, right? <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments about crystal ball, the industry changing and what impact that might have on this Asian American career ceilings issue? 
Well, I would say like, Al, I am an optimist. I mean, I believe the future is better than the past and we can move towards that future together, in which case I think tech is going to be a really important force in the future. And so having people with diverse voices and backgrounds there is only going to be more important over time. And so, you know, I think it's a great field. I am very happy and fortunate to be a part of this field at a time when it was booming. And I think it's going to continue to grow over the next 20 years. And I would totally encourage my kids to, to do, you know, to enter that field someday. Growth, as Jenny said, growth can make a huge difference, right? And uh, the technology industry in general is growing. So not every company is growing, but in general it's growing. So obviously it makes for easier success, right? Yeah. Al, any comments, any predictions? Deb took the words out of my mouth. The only thing I'd add is uh, tech and biotech, you know? So uh, the, the, those are growth, but I, I think, you know, to say any one industry, I, I, the advice I always got, which is why I majored in colonial Latin American history, do what you love. And if you do what you love, then it's not gonna feel like work. And then you're gonna be really good at it. And then if you're really good at it, then people will notice and it will open other doors. And I would say sometimes people can try to be overly prescriptive about if I do X and Y, then some outcome will happen. And life doesn't work that way, right? Relationships don't work that way. So I think as long as you do what you love, then you're gonna have some base level of happiness, no matter how the, the career works out. And more likely you're gonna do better. Uh, so, you know, I have three kids, one of whom is like almost in, in uh, you know, gonna go apply to college. And I, I try to inculcate, find something that you really love to do where you would do it even if, Mom and dad weren't forcing you to do that, which also happens from time to time. And, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully we can all live by that. Yeah, I think I that's- I want to echo what Al said. You know, it's so important. And I, I've, I've been having this conversation a lot lately with mentees and even with my staff that the, the idea of doing something you love makes the world of difference because- as we've all seen the last couple of years, it's been really hard to maintain our work-life balance and where our priorities are. And, you know, if we're not going to work every day and feeling that we're getting a good return on that investment, because I, I point out to our folks, it doesn't matter if you're in front of the computer or on the conference call, whatever, essentially two thirds of your life is on your job because even if you're not sitting in front of that computer, you're thinking about that work. And if you don't love what you're doing, it's not worth the value that you're giving into it, right? It's not worth the time investment, the energy, the effort, then you're in the wrong job, you're in the wrong profession. And I, I, I say this to everybody that I coach and mentor is go with the, the job that is what you love doing. And I, I've said this with my kids for many, many years. And I'm very fortunate that my kids all pick profession, not necessarily in engineering, more in medicine, but they're they're at least doing what they love. And, and they spend way more hours working than I do. So it's really critical. Um, but you have to tell them that they have to accept what comes with that profession. Yes. So if you really want to be an actor, great if you love it, but you have to accept that 99% of people going in, into acting ended up waiting tables in order to make a living. If you're okay with that, that's all right. But make sure you look at the other aspects and say, am I okay you know, with that? Yeah. With that, we, we have some questions. I'm gonna start with a few. So the first one is from Henry Tang, who is a Committee 100 member and one of the uh, founders. He says, please elucidate what you mean by quote, little motivation unquote, by senior executives to promote Asians. How could that obstacle be mitigated? So um, if you actually look at uh, diversity and inclusion, which is a very uh, big focus area for most corporations, um, there's a lot of emphasis about that diversity. Uh, and the focus, but here's the thing. Asian, uh, and, I, and I apologize, Asian male are not considered underrepresented minorities in the population. And so I really believe they do, are not getting any attention, focus, mentorship, sponsorship. Um, if we're lucky, Asian women may be 
part of that focus area because we're considered female. And in the tech industry, tech women is still a diverse, underrepresented minority somewhat, and there is still a lot of focus. So 30 years ago, it would have been different, but I would say in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of focus on women in technology and more sponsorship and support. And I would just say for Asian men, unfortunately, there's not a lot of focus or motivation, no indicators that are driving these execs to pay attention to that. So, But I do think we can change things. Like one thing I advocated for in a previous company was to include all Asians in executive positions or leadership positions or directors and up and to track that and to monitor it, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of like Ascend does for for, um, publicly. I think it's important, you know, if you look at a company where you have 30% maybe representation and at the leadership level, it's 10%, either something is structurally wrong or there's decisions being made, you know, unconsciously. And so, you know, it's something that that some companies are now adding. And so, it you know, it makes a difference when ERGs, you know, and these types of groups actually advocate for this and say, hey, this is a blind spot. Let us take a look at this and double click on it and see if this is an issue for us as well. Yeah, that's right. By the way, I had promised Al that this question would be on the list, but I would not put it up at the top, but it's come out, which is, uh, you know, do you, do the panelists feel they're, you know, what differences do you see on this issue for Asian American women versus Asian American men? Are the barriers uh, uh, bigger or smaller or are they are just different in nature? And, uh, you know, and this is not a question just for the, the, the woman on the panel. I mean, Al, you're an observer as well and your company's on this issue of gender. So you're entitled to give your observations as well. Any comments on this issue? Oh, by the way, we did do a survey. We did, we did actually at, at, did a survey, a whole bunch of millennials, both male and female. We asked them that question. It was very revealing uh, the difference in how the woman who answered the question, how they viewed the career barriers and at what stage than the men. It was very interesting. You know, you know um, I, I'd be curious whether it's Deb or Peter or if others even on the, on uh, on this webinar have any data, you know, Deb referenced a couple of times and I've read a number of studies as well on, you might have uh, 30% of a, uh, associates at a law firm are Asian, but only 5% of the partners or you name your company, you see that phenomenon of very good representation at the associate level and then very little at the executive level. And, and I think that mostly reflects uh, amazing educational achievement, but then barriers along the career, right? What I have not seen is then those ratios broken out by sex. So do, do Asian females actually do better or worse? So without having seen the data, I would imagine on one hand, Asian females have the double whammy of the Asian funnel <laughs> or, or <laughs> bad funnel but also the woman bad funnel, which again, I, I actually just read, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal like last week that the pay gap between male and female starts immediately after graduation and then only grows over time for the same major, same profession over the course of, of one's career. Uh, so without having seen the data, I would imagine it is broadly speaking compounded for women. Uh, I will say, maybe speaking for the guys out there, though, at least in our society, um, you know, the, the the guy is tends to get more emasculated just in depictions in society. You see that in dating patterns and marriage patterns in a massively pronounced way. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that then changes the numbers at all. But uh, again, I like to look at the data uh, and and just draw my conclusions from the data, which I don't have. Let me share but, the data. Actually, yeah, Buck yeah. is on here. He's worked, he's helped with the SEND uh, okay. pulling data together. There's a number of studies that Ascend has put together and I think it's, and I'm looking at the study. So I'll put a, I'll drop a answer to Buck's question because he did a ton of the work and you guys can click on the study. There's many, many studies that they have worked on. So I think it's, uh, let me, I'll just type the answer under Buck's question and then you guys can see some of the. Okay. The answer is there. And yeah, it is worse to be an Asian woman than it is to be an Asian man, but it's worse to be an Asian man than, you know, not. 
guess. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I mean, I think a lot of minorities mm -hmm. fall into the same category. But it has been worse to be female versus male across most industries, except the ones that are dominated by women, like nursing and that sort of thing, right? Putting those aside, you know, it just in general, we're working through trying to create an even playing field for women versus men, right? Any other comments on the male versus the, versus, for the special considerations for a woman in the technology industry? Well, I don't know that these are specific to tech. I've shared a couple of examples from my startup world, but I'll share a few more that don't relate directly to me. I, I actually have, um, uh, I think women, the reality is women have to, um, today and it's and it's gotten better um, but women today still have to make a different set of trade-offs uh, if they want to start a family um, there is a broader and and they in general are the primary caregivers for aging parents and the reality is something's got to give in that right we all have greedy jobs um, but caregiving also consumes time and so the um, there are there are practical realities of needing a support network if you want to have a greedy job and you want to have a family. So that's the first thing is the trade-offs that women end up having to, the decisions we have to make and how we create the support around us to do that. The second thing is um, building relationships. So often that sponsorship um, that we've spoken about because there aren't a lot of executives that look like us, a lot of senior leaders that look like us, that sponsorship um, happens by building relationships with people who don't look like us. And frequently the power structure, the more senior power structure is male. And um, there are different dynamics that women have to navigate in business wh when you are working to build relationships and advocacy and sponsorship with more senior male executives. Um, it's just, a, it can be a more complicated scenario. At times there are dynamics that you're just having to kind of work through. Will things be misinterpreted? How is this going to be? Are, are comments being made that I'm not comfortable with, right? So I was at a leadership conference dinner with a group of women of, of all, um, um, all ethnicities or, or several ethnicities. And uh, after a few cocktails, some of the conversation turned to, has everybody here, who here has had a situation, as we call it, we'll, we'll air quote situation. Everybody there had had a situation. Um, unwanted advances, things that happen that, you know, you maybe wouldn't, you, you definitely wouldn't want to put your, your, you know, daughter in that situation. And so you navigate through it, you kind of step over it. But the, the practical reality is when you're, you know, there aren't more women leaders in tech because there aren't more women leaders in tech. And so it's gotten better and we're building towards that. And by the way, again, to, to Al and, and Deb's point, I'm, I'm an optimist too. It's gotten better and it's getting better. Um, and most people are generally good, but there is a reality that there's a dynamic to navigate. And the third piece is um, the, I don't know if it's unconscious or as Al said earlier, you know, conscious bias, but people um, often will bring their own views and limitations into making decisions for you as a woman and what what you may and may not decide to do, right? If you're single and un if you're not married, no kids, oh, she's probably gonna get married and probably gonna have kids. And so what does that do to her career trajectory and ambition? And so the key is to be conscious that, you know, let's let's all, we, we need to be conscious that, you know, we want to the, to the greatest extent possible to be able to be the authors of our own story and making those decisions for ourselves. But I think for women, sometimes there's still kind of a, a broad dynamic because of the recognition of the first set of trade-offs, right? Um, that, you know, sometimes de those decisions are made thematically writ large um, in a way that they may not be for our male peers. And let's, for, let's not forget that they're, they're, like Al said, they're stereotypes about Asian American men they're clearly mm -hmm. stereotypes about Asian American women, right? And they don't, they don't necessarily help in terms of careers, right? Uh, so uh, I'm gonna have one last question for all the four panelists, but it's gonna be a, a one or two sentence uh, answer for each of you. But before that, uh, I wanna acknowledge two things. One is that Buck G, which we wanna thank for helping to get uh, some of the panelists. He didn't have a question, but he just had a comment saying, he had done an analysis of the Fortune 500 companies 
that didn't show a difference between you know entrepreneurial and mature companies and regionally. Uh, the other is a, a question which you know obviously I, I, everyone knows the answer is one of the attendees said, is the tension between China and the US going to make it harder? But I don't think we need to have a long discussion about it. You know, it, it's not helping. And the hate Asian thing is not helping. And you just have to take that into account. But there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you know, well, let me say there's less you can do about it because none of us here is going to be able to fix the US China, you know, relationship. And it's not just Chinese. I mean, you know, they're lumping everyone together, right? So whether you're Japanese American or Indian American or whatever, there's this general Asia hostility that that uh, that has erupted in part because of the tension between the China and the U.S. So the last question, and this is for each of you. Each of you now has to answer this question, which is, if you had one sentence on to 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 give on advice to the attendees about how to succeed in an environment of Asian American career ceilings, what would that sentence be? Constantly be adapting, learn what success looks like in your company, what they're looking for and adapt and learn those skills. You know, if for me, the biggest challenge was the one that Al said, and there's this, I wrote an article, so I have a newsletter called on Substack and I said the secret bias no one talks about. And that's the ability to really articulate, like speak, intelligently about anything, you get so much more credibility if you could speak on a dime and just answer questions. And so that's what I would suggest. Great, okay. Anyone next? I would but say be fearless. To answer. Go ahead. I, I would say be fearless. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be hard and you're gonna think you can't do it, but be confident that you can and, and give it a try. And there's nothing wrong with failing. If you fail, you learn something and you'll get it right the next time. So just be fearless and take that opportunity, even if you don't think you're ready for it. Um, yeah, just be confident and go for it. That's right. I'm gonna go with a different kind of answer. I would encourage you to have dinner parties at your home very regularly with your colleagues. Uh, I mentioned earlier, get to know them as people, get to know them as friends. Uh, I, my wife and I, fortunately, we just agreed we would do that because we enjoy it. Even when we had a super embarrassing little apartment and we invited senior people and uh, it, was, it was definitely a little embarrassing, that's okay. You can have different conversations, you get to know them as human beings and then that builds relationships that ultimately are the, you know, are the ones that are most rewarding. Uh, and no strings attached, just getting to know folks I would say that's been the, the greatest treasure, you know, in my in my career uh, over the last eighteen years here at Silicon Valley. And the and the addendum to Al's comment is, help as many of your colleagues get their kids into into college. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Shinwen, you have the if last someone, word. Shinwen, you, have the, you, have the, you, have the, you have the last word, uh, Shinwen. So use it wisely. <laughs> Al, I'm happy to help. I have uh, in my copious spare time and review college education or college applications. You know, I um, I love everything everyone said, so I won't repeat those. I'll plus one on those. Um, my piece of it, uh, a counsel would be life is an experiment. There's no right answer. It's all experimentation and discovery. Yeah, and you have to be resilient because one of the things I love is uh, reading the biographies of famous, successful people across many professions. And I can't find a single one that didn't have a major setback in their careers. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's FDR, you know, Albert Einstein, you, you name it, it's all true. So it's really what Jenny had to say is, you know, how do you be fearless and how do you persevere through change? Because the one thing you can count on is there will be something that happens to you at some point in your life, right? Whether it's under your control or not. So first of all, I wanna thank the four panelists. You, the four of you did a terrific job. I think the audience, I think, has come away with a lot of good insights and, and lessons. The last thing I want to say is the 21st uh, Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings event will be on September 22nd, and it's going to be different. It's going to be what should the AAPI community learn from the other communities with regard to how they've organized themselves 
either for getting people elected or otherwise. And there's some important lessons there because we are actually quite behind the African-Americans and the Latinos and the Jewish community in terms of as an ethnic group, right? Uh, organizing ourselves to succeed, uh, particularly along the career path. So there will be a notice that goes out, but we I encourage you, those who are interested in this topic, it's going to be on September 22nd, and we're going to have some terrific panelists. So thank you again to the panelists for your time and great insights, and thank you for all of you in attendance. I hope you found this uh, to be valuable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.